And we want to pick up where we left off last week as we talked about Jesus and the model He has given to us about making disciples. But as we do so very quickly, I just want to start with a recap to just remind us that God has a plan for the life of each and everyone that's right here. And His plan goes right not just from the time you were conceived in your mother's womb, not from the time you were just birthed out, but right from even the foundations of the earth. And I hear the words of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God says, let us make man in his very image and likeness and let them have dominion. In that, God has a plan for us collectively. It was in the time of Israel, there was a nation. And right now in our generation, there is that chosen generation and there is that church of Jesus Christ. As important as we remember this, also, I've thought about it, I'm not going to go over it again, but just to keep afresh something in the front of our eyes. And that is about why God made man perfect to have dominion in the world and yet put them in a garden. And in short, just a quick reminder that it was God trying to teach men that he could not live without God and that God must be central in all things. And that God must be the one that initiates things. And if you remember this, I want you to remember just three F's in this. God is always looking for faithfulness. In faithfulness, He will begin to, in a relationship, teach on faith. And in that faith, He begins to show us the way we should do things. And He looks for one more F, fruitfulness. And the underlining word of it was all was about obedience. And it's in this that Jesus began to reveal when he walked on this earth his method of disciple making. And this method we saw as we have been looking is based on what Acts chapter 1, verse 1 tells us of what Jesus both began to do and teach. Keyword Jesus' model disciple making is not just about teaching alone, but do and teach. Now, just quick reminder, I'm going to run over this very quickly. And his very, very model is in that two phases we have gone over. We call it the inclusio bracketing method where he bracketed the whole model between two verses and that was Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 and Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. And there we see the whole model. And he started with, and we remember this, in Matthew chapter, one, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, reminds us that this teaching was intended for disciples, not for the multitudes. Somebody say amen to that. I see disciples here. And this is important. Jesus seeing the multitudes, the Bible says, He went up to the mountain and He sat down and listened to this. And the disciples came to Him. Amen. How many know that disciples need to come? Praise God. I hear all these talks today. Today, we are the church, so we can stay at home and stay at home. The Bible says, no, disciples need to come, and not only come, to sit at the feet of Jesus. Amen. And in this, we see the context. We talked about it, how Jesus, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 2, begin to talk about how we are blessed. Makarios, remember the word? And there is a need for the right attitudes. And we have talked about the Beatitudes already. If you have not been with us over this, go back. Okay, a month back, we talked about the eight Beatitudes and the ninth one as well. Some say eight, some say nine, but anyway, praise God. Whatever it is, it's about right attitudes. And then after talking about right attitudes, remember what we spoke about last week. What was the key? Amen. And how did he start it by saying? What did he, Jesus say? You are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. He didn't say, you shall be, you may be, you can be. He says, you are. And the crux, if you have been with us last week, it will understand that to be salt, salt has to be applied. But there is a caution that as it's applied, it will begin to preserve. Amen? It can also flavor. But we need to understand 
and this is what we talked about, that salt can be diluted or adulterated. And the Bible, the light, amen. The essence of light really and darkness is this. What is darkness? Absence of light, amen. Okay, so simple, right? Darkness is the absence of light. We are all brightly lit here. The moment you switch off the light, there is darkness. And when you switch on the light, remember, the light so shines. And does darkness fight against the light? No, darkness just recedes and disappears before the light. And the caution that was given to us, or the, I wouldn't use the word caution, or the exhortation that was given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ, is that our light must so shine that it need to be put on a lampstand. You do not hide the light. You need to be the light because you are the light. And then after talking about being the light, the salt, he then begins to approach one thing. He begins then to state his position on the law and what has been taught as a prophet. Now, if you've got the Bibles, I want to start by turning to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to start reading here from verse 17. Okay, now we are at Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And this is what Jesus started by saying to those disciples, Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Keywords, destroy, fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass away from the law. And this is the key words the King James Version say, till all things be accomplished. Amen? And goes on. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these commandments and shall teach men so, shall be called least in the kingdom. But whosoever shall do and teach, keyword again, listen, do and teach, not just teach, do and teach, okay, them, what do you say? You'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now here comes in verse 20 that caution, for I say unto you, accept your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. With this, I must just say this in passing. That righteousness is not something that we can attain by just trying to keep the law. Righteousness is something that actually enables us to be what the law wants us to be. Put a finger on that, I'll talk about that a bit more. But let's address one thing. Why did Jesus talking about the right attitudes, talking about being who you are, then begin to talk about the law? Is there a need for the law? Now, perhaps... One statement I can say is without the law, we only can have lawlessness. Amen? Because we must understand that there is a purpose for the law. The law as God gave to men was to reveal basically what? His nature, his character, is also to reveal his standards and to set the boundaries that he wants to see as we live the life in Him, with Him, and for Him. And this was given in 10 simple commandments. But in these 10 simple commandments, as time evolved in the days of Moses, it became what the Judas, uh, Jews knew as the law. The law was not just a 10 commandments. The law began to encompass 613 Levitical rules and regulations. 248 of them were positive. 365 of them were negative. Wow. 10 simple commandments. 613 
Levitical laws, if you like to call it. The whole book of Torah was around not just the Ten Commandments, but there are 613 other rules and regulations that came. In these rules and regulations, there was the introduction of rituals. There was the introduction of certain basic foundations, certain things they had to comply with, and in it also the institution of worship to the Levitical Levites through the raising of a tribe of Levites. And we must understand that yet men could not realize and could not understand, men could realize that they could not even abide by all this. So by the time of Jesus, it's interesting. And that's why Jesus had to immediately address a situation. In that by the time of Jesus, there had already been 26 thousand volumes of rabbinic writing trying to explain the Ten Commandments and the 613 laws and rules and regulations of the Torah. And there were two major writings. One was the Talmud. The Talmud became the central text of rabbinic Judaism. It was not just the Ten Commandments. Therefore, you had the Talmud. And there was also the Mishnah. The Mishnah was first written as a reaction of Jewish oral traditions. And they were known often as the oral Torah, the oral law. So, on top of this, 26,000 volumes and two major handbooks, so to speak. Okay, and by the time of Jesus, there was also two major schools of teaching and thought, two sects. And these two sects were diametrically opposed in their way of teaching and thinking, and even what they saw as a foundation of the basis of the law. There was the Halal school and there was the Shamal school. So under these teachings, you see the birthing out of scribes. You see different sects like the Sadducees and you see the Pharisees. And then out of this, the law became such an onerous rituals and rules and regulation. It became legalistic. It became also what? Practices that centered around the temple, the temple worship, and centered around the power that was controlled by the people who ran the temples. Positions of power set up by the rulers of the temple. So this was a scenario Jesus came. And in this, he was trying to tell his disciples, look, I know the people have been hoping for something, that with the coming of the Messiah, some of these Heavy burdens will be taken away. Not only having to go for the festivals, having to bring your offerings and having to bring your sacrifices, and not only just bringing offerings, sacrifices, you have to do it a certain way. You can only buy the lambs from the fields of the high priest. There was a certain exchange rate. Your money was useless in going to the temple. There was an exchange rate for special temple currency. And so all this was controlled. Now, you may say, ah, that's for the time of Jesus. Well, let me tell you this. The church was birthed out with a certain liberty that comes from the teaching of Jesus. There was a liberty that moved with the Spirit. But I must say this, that over that almost 2,000 years of church history, we have also become broken up into denominations, sects, perhaps you may say, different teachings, this 7,487 covenant promises of God has come to so many interpretations. If you look at all the books that are available in Christian book rooms, I'm sure you must get completely confused or lost. You come to my room, I got a lot of books. I must tell you, the more I read of it, the more I got confused. And there's one point of time I had to come back and say, let me go back to the Word of God. Amen? Let me go back to this Bible. And this then became the very ethos of the birth of what covenant vision is based on. That we need to be word-based. Amen? We need to be spirit-led. And we need to be faithful to respond to the teaching of Jesus Christ. And I realized sometimes you find that I had to repeat and to repeat and repeat. How many know that Jesus did the same thing? Why? Because people, Chinese say, Bui now cannot enter here. It only enters and ins as information. 
And how many know that information by itself only puffs you up? And the Bible talks about not only need for information, but the need for information to drop one foot down to your heart where faith begins. But I want to tell you this, that I realized to respond to the word, it needs to drop one more foot down right into inner man, where under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there can be a conviction, a conviction to respond in faith. Somebody say amen to that. And so we understand this now. I believe it doesn't just apply to those days. Today, in our church, we have also got so many doctrines, creedal beliefs. we got so many rituals. we got many things that are brought in by church tradition and practice. And I hear it very often, different people with different perspectives of the very Word of God. So here Jesus starts by saying something. And Matthew chapter 5 verse saying, Think not, he asked the disciples. It means they have been thinking. What they have been thinking about. So he's trying to say, think not. And this will set your mind straight. Think not that I come to destroy the law. All the prophets, now understand this. He was not just talking about the Ten Commandments. He was talking about all these 613 Levitical laws as well. He's also talking about all those books of the major prophet, minor prophets. Now you may say, I pastor, all this, now I hear this teaching, doesn't apply to us. At the cross, divine exchange, all passed away, all things have become new. Amen? And we, the law doesn't apply to us. And let me say this to you, the same statement I started with. If we have no revelation of God to the laws and standards of God, we are a lawless people. Okay, remember this thought, okay? Don't get led astray by all these teachings now. They say at the cross there was the divine exchange and there was a partition. So everything that Jesus taught before the cross doesn't apply to us New Testament saints after the cross. How many heard those teachings now? Scary. But the Word of God reminds us that in the final days of the end times will come perilous times. There, was, there will be many false teachers. There's many false Christs that are becoming, many false lights that are becoming. And if you are not careful, we can have the hardness of heart. Second Timothy chapter 3. Okay, and the warning is what? As a result, we can be ever learning, but never coming into the knowledge of truth. People of God, we are in that dangerous times even right now. We can be ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of truth. And I always remember, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And understand that no one comes to the Father, he said, except through him. Amen. Not just by him, but through him. You know, it took me a long time to understand that. And so, when you read those very words of Jesus, think, he says, not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets, I've heard people say that he said he already destroyed. I say others say that, oh, he transformed the law. Others claim that by accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, a Christian is now freed from the obligation to obey the law. We are in a dispensation of grace. Amen. I want to tell you this. Did grace exist in the Old Testament? Amen. Abraham was not only the father of the law, but he was the father of grace because it was accounted to him for righteousness, not because he obeyed the law. He accounted him for righteousness because he believed. That's grace. By grace, we are saved. Through what? Faith. Amen. And we must understand this right perspective. Grace is an aspect of of what Jesus came to bring. Grace did not come in the New Testament. And grace, and Paul had to deal with it even in the early church. Let not grace be a license to sin. Hear the word, sin. What was the purpose of law? To reveal sin. If there's no sin, there's no need for grace. If you say there's no law, 
then there's no sin. If there's no sin, you don't even need grace. Amen. Okay, I'm not going to teach on, on grace, but enough to just put this on a handle and remember this. So the common explanation given is that Jesus' obedience is now given credit to all who believe. And because we believe, we don't need to keep the law because Jesus has kept it all for us. How many of you heard the teaching? Right? And the effect of this reasoning is to conclude that Jesus did destroy the law, contrary to even what he has said to tell his disciples, think not. I want to ask a question right now. Did Jesus keep the Ten Commandments for us? Not sure. Did Jesus keep the Ten Commandments for us? If you say yes, then I'm going to say this to you. If He's kept all the commandments, then you are freed from the commandments. Does that mean we can worship other gods because Jesus has kept the commandments on behalf? Does it mean we can have religious images? I know you say, ah, that was Old Testament. I say it again. Does that mean we can have religious images? Do you know I've seen the cross as one of the biggest religious image? Do you know where I have seen a lot of crosses beside the cemetery? In some Christian homes. I want to get real. I see a cross at every door. I see a cross facing every doorway and passageway. Do you know that we come to a stage we think there's power in the cross? And you know a lot of Chinese believe we put something to pack chair <laughs> to, to, to turn the evil away. So we put a cross here, pack chair. Put a cross there, pack chair. Put a cross there, pack chair. I, I'm serious. And I, I still remember when at times I go to do, in the old days, house blessing. And after that, they always bring me a cross and say, Pastor, can you pray for the cross? And tell us where should we hang the cross? Amen. If it was that simple, the cross is but nothing but a symbol of our faith, of what we believe in the finished work of Jesus at the cross. Okay, I don't mean to shatter any religious ideas, but there's no power in the cross of Jesus. Don't believe what the movies have taught you about Dracula. When you bring the cross, it's going to run away. Amen. Remember, there's a power of your faith in the finished work of what Jesus did at the cross. So religious images, okay, just because Jesus kept the second commandment doesn't mean that we can now have religious images either. Can we take God's name because Jesus had done that, fulfilled that commandment for us? As Jesus honoured his parents in the fifth commandment, can we say now we don't have to honour because Jesus did it all for us? I mean, I know you are right-thinking people, so you say, where are we going with all this? Ah, because Jesus did not commit murder, he did not commit sexual sins, he did not steal, he did not covet. Therefore, automatically, he has fulfilled it all, and therefore, we are free of all these things. How many know that we are still struggling with all these things? Okay, amen. So, understand. Jesus said, destroy. And this is the Greek word, katulo. And that is very interesting. It means to lose or unloose what we were before bound with. That's the Greek lexicon word for it. And does it mean that we are loose from the obligation law so that we don't have to keep it? I struggle with this too because when I got saved, there was all this teaching going, don't be legalistic, don't be this, you're that, you're pharisaical, therefore now you must walk in the liberty of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Let's complete the quotation of Matthew 5.17. Do not think that I come to destroy the law. I did not come, Jesus said, but to fulfill. Now, key word. Don't just focus on the word destroy. Focus on the word fulfill. Now, even in the word fulfill, what does it mean? He came to set men free from the obligation of the law according to the statement. He came to fulfill it, therefore he set us free of obligation. What obligation? I think this is a big question. What obligation of the law? Now, we need to understand that Matthew 5, 18, Jesus goes on to tell us emphatically, for verily I say unto you, 
till heaven and earth pass. One jot, one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Keyword. He actually likens the permanency of the law to what? To the whole heavens and the earth itself. You know, it took me a long time to understand it. And I said, God, what are you trying to say here? Huh. There is a permanency of the law. That the law still continues to exist. No means passed away. So we hear people trying to find their own rationale. I heard this another teaching. Okay, Jesus fulfilled the first four commandments. So Christians only need to, need to abide by the social commandments, the last six of the Ten Commandments. But yet, if you read the statement of Jesus Christ, He did not make any distinction. Okay? And this is important. Now let's look at the word fulfill in Greek. Fulfill is the word P-L-E-R-O-O. Play rule. Okay? To make full or fill or to fill up to fill to the full. That's what the Greek uh, English lexicon tells me. So fulfill can mean two things. To complete or accomplish, one thing. Or it can also mean to fill to the full. Now, again, if you believe that Jesus came to complete, you may read Matthew 5, 17 this way. I did not come to destroy the law, but to end it by fulfilling it. That's one way of reading it. I did not come to destroy the law, but I came to end it by fulfilling it. Now, wow, if you believe that, let's understand this as you read the whole verse again. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Now, reading in a context, you will find that Jesus' clear intent is showed in the way he lived his life. In that 30 odd years he lived on this world, what did he do? Both in his life and teaching, you understand, Jesus fulfilled the law. That is what he did in his life to imply to us that he filled it to the full. He became the word that became flesh for us to understand how we need to live it also to the full. Not like the scribes of Pharisees that made it into a legalistic letter of the word and become something that brought without it liberty but bondage and people were just under bondage all the time, bondage all the time. And guess who profit from the bondage? The Pharisees. Pay me more money. When you pay me more money, what I can pray for you, I can do this for you. And therefore, you get set free. And everything became very legalistic. Right down even to baptism can also be a legalism. Okay, I need to get baptized every time I don't feel good enough. I go to a priest and the priest will dip me, dip me. Ah, when the priest dip you, dip you in the old days, huh? Uh, every time they dip, 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 they also what? Collect, 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 collect. Okay, don't think that all this was sometimes free services. Only in the church we see free services. Okay, I'm not running out anybody, please. <laughs> but in the old days, it was really a whole system. Everything was... Amen. It was just like, I remember when we had somebody passed away we knew, and they go to the, the non-believers' way. Wow, I tell you, they were really organized. They got all this done. The monk can chant up to here. You pay so much. Up to here, you pay so much. Up to here, you want it more? Yeah. It's not a whole pack. It's not a full package. Right? It's how much you pay that you get. Wow, I was quite surprised. I say we all Christian pastors don't know how to organize it right now. <laughs> But yet, amen, our focus is not about the money, amen. <laughs> but important thing here. So as we look at this, the word fulfill, I struggle with. And I believe this. You look at it, he magnified God's law and in his life, right? And this is true. By his perfect example, he gave full meaning to what the law is, not the legalism and everything else. He underemphasized in his teachings, and I went through his teaching over and over again, there was deep underlying principles and in it, he called for a total commitment to keep it, not just the external obligations, but what? 
not just external obedience, but about thought and action. About not just the letter of the law, but the intent of the heart. You know, that's why faith went from the Old Testament. And I always say this, it took me a long time when God spoke to me, I didn't believe it. I took the King James Version and I googled the word faith. And I was shocked to see that faith, as F-A-I-T-H, only appeared in the Old Testament twice. And even the Old Testament, the word faith in Hebrew should have been more correctly translated as faithfulness. You will see this even in Habakkuk 2.4. And the just shall live by... Your New Testament saints. Go to Old Testament, it says, the just shall live by his faith individual. New Testament, it was changed to quote by his faith, not faithfulness. You see, in the old, they were just given a set law and God saying, okay, try and keep the law. But in the new, faith is defined differently. 268 times not only spoken about, it was defined, it was explained, and there were examples. The whole chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, is about examples of faith. And faith has now become what? A faith that comes from relationship, a faith that's birthed out through hearing, and a faith that is what? Based on obedience, that after you hear, you have a choice whether you obey. Amen? That is the New Testament dimension. Okay? The choice now becomes even stronger. Now, the intent we got to understand of Jesus' statement is what? Uphold everything that the law and what the prophets say and do. I want to say this again. Just because Jesus came as a mortal, as son of God, to free the rest of God's children from our responsibilities to Heavenly Father? No. It will be like, okay, I said, because the oldest son is obedient to the father and fulfill all the obligations of being obedient, does it mean the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth son need not do anything but live on the obedience of the elder son? No. We are each called ourselves now into a relationship as New Testament saints. Okay, listen to this word even. Now unto him, God, he's still able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all all that you can ask or imagine. Oh, Ephesians 3.20. But listen, the Bible did not stop there. What did he say? According to the power that worketh within you. You see, as a New Testament saying now, there is a power that's working within you. As a New Testament saying now, you're no longer the old, under a set of laws, and an obligation just to be faithful to the set of law. Under the New Testament now, you are a new person, a new creation. The old has passed away. All things have become new. In the New Testament now, what happens? Your body has become a temple of the Holy Spirit. And understand this, that wherever you go right now, because you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, you are the house of God. Because your house of God, understand this. What Jacob saw in the old as a prophetic word, an open heaven. And what did he say? Wherever the house of God is, that's the gateway to heaven. I want you to understand that as the New Testament saying today, you have become the house of God. Wherever you walk, there's an open heaven just above you. That's the power that's within you. That's the power of your choice today. That's the power of your faith today. That's the power of what you believe even today. Amen? Amen. If you believe God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, He can do it. Amen? But what's your choice in response? And this is important. That's why Jacob saw this a ladder like a helix went up and there was angels ascending. Notice, huh? 
It was not angels descending first. It was angels ascending and then descending. Ascending as our faith ascend. And descending to bring the heavenly promises. There's a yes and amen up there to become a yes and amen down here. Amen. Heavenly promises. Earthly realities. I want you to catch this. And you are that conduit today. Understand this. That doesn't free you from the obligation of God's standards. What Jesus is say is this. Now, you are even greater than the Old Testament says. The sins of the fathers no longer is passed on as generational sins. Today you've been set free. Set free to what? To live the life as you choose? No. To live the life according to the dimensions of what God has for you. God wants you to be the head and not the tail. He wants you to be above and not beneath. Amen? He looks at you today. Who are you? Look at somebody and say, God has made you a winner. I want you to understand, He's made you a winner. He's made you a champion. But how do you know that a winner cannot win until he runs and breasts the tape? Amen. A winner doesn't sit down and say, I am a winner, I am a winner. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's have a party right here in the church. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And the world is down there needing the salt and waiting for the light. Amen. And the salt and the light is salting each another and lighting up each another. Hello. <laughs> These are realities. I mean, God began to tell me this. He has fulfilled. He didn't come to destroy. He didn't come to end it. But He's made it a fool. So the right reading for us, what? We are then able to not only be like Jesus. That's about discipleship. We want to be more like Jesus. We need to think with the mind of Christ. We need to function in the anointing, in the power, in the authority that God has already given to us. And how many know that authority demands a fruitfulness that comes from multiplication. Amen. What you have received, you are to learn to freely give. What you have received, i repeat this, it is not for you to retain it, to sit in church and know that in a sweet by and by, you're going to heaven. Amen. In a sweet by and by, you will stand before God. And God will say, I fulfilled it all. I showed it all to you. What have you done as a disciple? Then you're going to say, I cast out demon. I do this, I do that. And he's going to say, I still know you not. Because the crux of faith is not just about doing works for God. It's about obedience. It's about the relationship. It's about knowing what He wants you to do. Amen. It's not about works for salvation. You have already received it. But it's by transformation through the engrafted Word of God that's going to renew your mind. Amen? The process of metamorpho, where you go from being a caterpillar to a butterfly, when that you become the ugly worm to be the beauty that the world will see, that the world will know, and the world will want to be like. Somebody say amen to that. And this is what I think the crux of what Jesus is trying to say. Just because He has done it doesn't mean that we can sit down. He, let me use the word, He magnified the law. Now, let me explain this. The prophecy in Isaiah 42, 21 says this, The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness. Whose righteousness sake? The Messiah to come. And listen to these words of Isaiah. He will exalt the law and make it honourable. It did not say He will destroy the law and abolish it, but He will exalt. Now let's look at the word exalt. In the old King James, some use the word magnify. Now in Hebrew, it's gadai. 
G-A-D-A-I. And it really means to become strong, powerful, significant, or valuable. And it talks about what? To magnify is something where you bring forth to a world to see. So this is important. What did Jesus trying to say? Is God, the Lord God is well pleased with the Messiah's righteousness. And what? He will exalt the law. He will begin to be strong, grow up, begin to show the law itself to make it honourable so that you and I, listen to this very carefully, and that's why Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, so that you and I today, what are we? That's why the disciples caught it. We are the chosen generation. We are the royal priesthood. We are the holy nation. We are people who show forth the praises of Him because He has called us when we were darkness. Now we are light. Eh? We are not a people of God. Now we are a people of God. We did not know mercy and now we have received mercy. So why do? What are you to do? Hobson's choice. You know Hobson's choice? No choice. No choice. <laughs> God gave you choice. But yet God says, you are the salt, you are the light. You've got no choice. Because if you don't go and salt the earth, you say what? Salt loses its ever, it's going to be trampled underfoot and cast out. Understand this. There's no choice. You are who you are. And you will be who you will be. Amen. Now you understand why I've been asking to declare this word over you. Remember what we declared? I can be what this word says. I can be, but not just can. I will be what this Word of God says I will be. There's action on your part. Then I said, I am what the Word of God says I am. That's it. Begin to sing it now. Amen. You've been sitting, standing, declaring, and one more foot down. Amen. So understand this. God has fulfilled it. And God's plan, I won't tell you this, that God's plan to glorify humanity in His kingdom has already been completely accomplished. But so long as there's flesh, I want you to hear this, the law will continue to exist. Not to bring us into pharisaical legalism, not to bring us into legalistic, ritualistic practices, uh, as long as there are fleshy human beings like you and I, the physical codification of God's law in Scripture, I want you to hear this, is going to endure as long as the existence of the universe carries humanity in flesh. So what's the Ten Commandments today? And Jesus did not say, I just come to fulfill. Here comes the next words. Whosoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments. Listen to it. Who breaks one of the least? The least. Which is the least? Which is the greatest? We'll talk about that in a minute. And teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teach them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You notice that? It's not just being a teacher. Many of us want to be a teacher. But Paul says, I run out, you'll be teachers. Not that he doesn't exalt the teaching profession. Amen. But be careful what you're teaching. As you teach, you expect to do. And there is a greater accountability to the teacher too. Amen. Okay. So understand this. Very important. Now, when Jesus said that, he was really talking about the commandments they had to follow. So very quickly today, I want to conclude ah, on time. In conclusion, now I talk about the law. And next week, a uh, week after, okay, I'll be talking about understanding the spirit of the law, the intent of law, as opposed to the letter of the law and the legalism that comes from the law. Okay? So I want to say in conclusion, clearly the Bible says that we are not free from keeping the law because Jesus fulfilled the law for us. Amen? I hope that sank in. Second is that 
those who follow Jesus and desire to be in His kingdom, I want you to hear this. You are obligated to obey, keep, and uphold the law. Yes. In fact, as I'm going to talk about the week after, many times Jesus even said this. You can be a believer. You think you're safe and go to heaven. But what do you say? If you're a fornicator, living the life of fornication, what do you say? You shall not enter the kingdom. Woo! You didn't read the fine print. <laughs> Every agreement got fine print. Okay, don't just read the big, big print. The fine print is what catches you. Okay? Now, on Jesus' teaching on the commandments. I want you to turn with me in conclusion to Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to give you two passages of Scripture. Matthew chapter 22. Have you got a Bible? Turn there to Matthew chapter 22. And here comes a story. In verse 35. Then one of them, which is a lawyer. Aha. He's not talking about me. I'm no more a lawyer. <laughs> and this lawyer trying to be very smart. He comes to ask a question. Now, he's not coming to find the answer because he's coming to tempt Jesus. Tempt him. To make him, when you tempt, it's different from trials that will lift you up. Temptation is with the hope of catching. You see, there are a lot of catch-22 situations. And so, knowing what Jesus said, probably, he comes to say, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. In this is the first and great commandment. And then he didn't stop with this. And the second is like unto it the same. Means the second is as great as the first. You can't put in terms of ranking. He said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he says, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You all get that in? Go back and meditate upon what Jesus is saying. If you look at the Ten Commandments, really, you can divide the Ten Commandments into these two. It's about loving God. It's about loving your neighbor. One thing to understand, you cannot minister unless you learn your relationship with God. That as you minister to God, you get ministered by God. And out of that ministry you receive, you minister. Amen? Very important. We don't minister out of our own strength. We don't minister out of our good intentions. We do not minister even out of our human desire to be obedient. You see, whatever we do for Him comes from whatever we have with Him. I pause here for a minute. Let's sink in. Two commandments greatest, and yet, they're equal par because every commandment that God gives is linked. It's like the Beatitudes. You can't say, I want this or I want that. One flows to the other and they're all in equal importance. Amen. I give you another verse here. John 13, 34. And Jesus said this, a new commandment I give you now. Love one another. And what do you say? As I have loved you. Then he stressed that ye also love one another. Love one another. Understand the love of Jesus. Come from the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God so loved, He gave. And He didn't stop that statement. What did He say in verse, the next verse 35? By this 
shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen? You see, I've said this before and I say it now again. This love is not something that you can work at. This love is not something that you choose to obey. This love that God has for us is His love because that's His nature, that's His character. And I want to keep saying this until you all can catch this. Because God is love. He cannot not love you. It took me a long time. Agape love is not by choice. Agape love is because of who He was and who you are today. Let us sing in a bit. And again, I finally conclude to just say to those who believe that we are under great grace today. I always joke about it. When great grace came upon the early church, the Bible says in Acts that they sold everything they had and they brought it and they laid it at the feet of the disciples. Wherever I say that, I ask people, do you all want great grace? <laughs> because great grace brings God love in such a dimension that there's no more counting of what's yours, what's mine. You must understand this. Well, don't even say that the grace is now and not of the law. That the teaching of Jesus Christ does not apply to us as New Testament saints today. I want to give you two verses. Write it down. Meditate upon it. Galatians 6, 2. No more law. I want to hear this. Bear ye one another's burdens. Now, this is after the cross. In Galatians, Paul was saying this. And so fulfill the law of Christ. If you think you are not under law, you are under a new set of law, and I will talk about the week after. That brings you into a higher level of accountability. That brings you into a higher level of responsibility. That calls for a response that's not from here. Not just from desire. I always like to quote this. Where your heart is, that's where the, your treasure will be. How many agree with this? Not sure. I see some shake like that. Some shake like that. <laughs> Lord, ask God heart for Jesus. But you know what Jesus said? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Not where your heart is. Many of us, our heart is for Jesus, but yet we're not willing to put our treasure there first. In 1 Corinthians 9, 21, Paul said this after talking about the difference between those who are under law and those without the law. He said, to them that are without law, now he emphasized as without law, not being without law to God, some people who believe they got law to God, but under law to Christ, that I may gain them that are without law. Amen. The law of, the law of Christ has a purpose that we can fulfill and accomplish the Great Commission. Amen? The law of Christ so constrains us, then we will be able to live the life of Christ in this world that is lost, in this world that's needy, in this world that need you and I to be living bridges to a lost and needy world. Let's quiet our hearts now.